Okay, so next lecture is the Constitution. So your learning objectives, basically we're just going to talk about the structure of the Constitution, talk about congressional power as it relates to commerce, um, explain the relationship between um, the Constitution, states, and commerce, I guess. Um, and then I'm going to take a little bit of instructor um, liberty, and I am going to include a lecture on the Bill of Rights that um, I developed a couple of years ago, but I like it. And I think it covers the content pretty well. So um, that is going to, you might see a little hiccup in the slides, but that's why that is. So the Constitution um, is really the basis of our legal system and government. And when you think about it, it was drafted in 1787 and it still holds true today. We are working on our first Constitution. And yes, granted, we've had amendments. Um, however, when you look at other countries who have modeled their constitutions after ours, um, France, for example, um, in the same span of time, uh, they have had, they have drafted and redrafted their constitution many times. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up to you. But my point is, is that the fundamental document itself has endured um, for all of these many really centuries at this point. Um, one of the things that the, that is so great about the Constitution is it's relatively short. Um, it's not 40 pages long. I think if you um, take a look at it, it's like maybe five, 10, and you can easily read it in a sitting. I know it's kind of dry, but it is kind of important that you, really, you know what's in the Constitution. Um, so if you ever get a chance, you should read it. Um, I won't assign that to you, um, but I am probably going to talk. I'm, you know, you should know about what your protections are. Um, it lays out the separation of powers that is a hallmark to the U.S. form of government, the um, legislative, judicial, and executive branches, and it is divided into seven articles that basically does that. Um, Article one is legislative branch, two executive branch, three judicial branch. Article four defines relationships or describes relationships between the states. Article five provides the process for amending the constitution. I mean, look at that. The framers were so smart that back in 1787, they included a clause about what do we do if, what do we do if we need to make changes to this thing or add to this thing. Kind of cool. Uh, article six is the supremacy clause, and article seven is the process for ratification or how the Constitution would be ratified um, and made the law of the land. So um, let's talk about the Commerce Clause because that's probably the single most important element of the Constitution that might relate to business and business relationships. Um, part of Article One, Section Eight. Um, which gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the states. Um, and so Congress is really the power that regulates interstate commerce. The states have the right to regulate commerce within their borders, but once something goes from one state to another, then that gives Congress the right to regulate that trade. And it's designed to bring coordination and fairness among interstate commerce. And it stops the states from imposing taxes and regulations that wreck the nation's domestic trade. We want states to be able to um, do business and people to be able to do business within the state's borders and with folks from other states, and we want states to be able to do business with one another. And so uh, Congress regulates all of that interstate commerce. Congress also has the right to regulate any activity that has a substantial economic effect on interstate commerce, and that's under the substantial effect rule. And so right now, um, just thinking about all of the, you know, as, as AI is um, developing at light speed. Um, you know, that is something that has a suspect that can and will have a substantial effect on interstate commerce, which is why you see Congress holding hearings 
about um, what's going on with AI um, because they're using their right to um, to uh, their because they're using their power over an activity that has a substantial effect on the U.S. economy. Um, all, another element of the Commerce Clause is what's called the dormant aspect of the Commerce Clause. And basically what the dormant aspect does is it holds that a state statute that discriminates against interstate commerce is almost always unconstitutional. And so here's how that looks. So let's say that, um, the so, okay, so California, big cheese producer, Wisconsin, big cheese producer. And let's say that in California, um, the um, legislature and the governor's office says, you know, we, re we really want California cheese to be the best cheese there. We think it's the best cheese in the, in the United States, but we want it to be the best cheese in the United States. So we are going to give our dairy farmers a special tax break, and they're going to get an additional 10% uh, tax rebate on all of their, um, on all of their cheese-based revenues. Well, if Wisconsin isn't doing the same thing for their cheese farmers, it gives California dairy, the California dairy industry, an unfair advantage. And that could definitely impact the ability for the Wisconsin cheese farmers to produce cheese and be successful. Um, and when you look at the various industries where multiple states, you know, think about wine, California, New York, Oregon, Washington, all big wine producers, orange, oranges, Florida, California, um, avocados, Florida, California. And so there's lots of industries, automotive, the automotive industry. Um, so there's lots of industries where um, states could play, for lack of a better word, unfair um, and give their domestic industry an advantage. And so the dormant aspect of the Commerce Clause says, nope, that's unconstitutional and it violates federal law. Uh, the Supremacy Clause is also probably one of the most important elements of the Constitution. And the Supremacy Clause basically says that the Constitution reigns supreme. The Constitution, federal law, federal statutes and treaties are the supreme law of the land. If there is a conflict between a federal and a state statute, Federal law supersedes state law. So when you think about something that might be legal from a state perspective and illegal from a federal perspective, technically it's illegal because the federal law preempts state law. Um, thinking about recreational marijuana use. Recreational marijuana use is legal in many, many states. It is still illegal federally. And so what that means is if we have a president someday that is unhappy or thinks that marijuana is, is harming society, that president can technically direct their Department of Justice to come into all of those states and start arresting folks. This is never going to happen. Um, and start arresting folks or arresting dispensaries or, or shutting down dispensaries, I guess, is what would actually happen. Um, shutting down dispensaries who are selling recreational marijuana. Um, again, never going to happen, but it's just an example of how you can have something that is legal, legal on the state side, illegal on the federal side, and technically that federal law supersedes state law. Why hasn't a president done that yet? Because we haven't had a president who has seen that, that there is any harm in um, the use of marijuana. Um, Barack Obama was the first president who really said, I'm not, it's yes, it's illegal federally, but I don't really care about that. Um, and really every president after him has kind of like followed the same, um, uh, followed the same line of thinking. Um, so that's the supremacy, that, that is uh, the supremacy clause. The other, uh, so when there is no conflict between the, when there is no conflict um, between federal and state statutes, and Congress decides to exert control at, over an issue, then that control is exerted at the federal level. So again, AI, um, if Congress decides that we want to start regulating AI, then it becomes a federal thing, not a state thing. Okay? 
So that is uh, the supremacy clause. Um, next, we are going to talk a little bit about the Bill of Rights. Like I said, here is where I'm going to preempt this lecture with um, my lecture on the Bill of Rights. And so I will see you on the other side. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. They provide you with protections from the government. We're always talking about protections from the government uh, with respect to the Bill of, Bill of Rights, not individuals or entities. You have legal protections against individuals and entities, but those are civil, not constitutional. We'll talk about those next week. The um, Bill of Rights is designed to protect your individual liberties. It's designed to protect, uh, to provide protections for the accused and to guarantee you some individual freedoms. So let's go ahead and dive in. Your individual liberties are amendments one through four. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of religion speech, press, assembly, and redress of grievances. And one thing I think you might um, notice with the Bill of Rights is you can really see what the founders of our nation were fleeing from in the freedoms that they granted us. Um, that, that they, you know, the, the freedom of, of religion is probably first and foremost because they were, they were fleeing um, they were looking for a place where they could practice religious freedom. Uh, the Second Amendment uh, and, and redress of grievances basically means that um, you have a right, if, if the government has done you wrong, uh, to have that wrong corrected. Um, freedom of assembly is your right to assemble, although the government can dictate time, place, and manner. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech, religion. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple more slides on, on the First Amendment, so I'm going to skip this for now and, and we'll move on to uh, two, three, and four. Uh, Second Amendment is the right to bear arms and assemble militias. One of the complaints about this amendment is that, that it, it was intentionally vague, um, and so uh, the definition of arms in 1776 is a little bit different in, than in um, the the 2020s. Uh, and so this, I think, is one that we're, we're always going to see a lot of conflict about, uh, debate, perhaps. Uh, Third Amendment, uh, no quartering of soldiers, uh, means that uh, militia groups and members of the military can't uh, just hold up in your house during times of war. Uh, Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable search and seizures. It's a ban on unreasonable search and seizure. The government just can't come into your house at any time and go through your stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to criminal law, so we're just going to put a pause on uh, the Fourth Amendment. Reviewing uh, a little bit more about the First Amendment and your freedom of speech. Um, your freedom of speech is protected with some caveats. The first caveat is political speech is actually a little bit more protected. A politician can say pretty much anything he wants about another politician. He can even lie as long as um, his speech is not intended to create eminent lawless action. So if political speech is designed to create uh, violence or incite violence, then the government can come in and um, silence it or ban it. The government has the right to regulate time, place, and manner. So basically what that means is that if I have a student who um, in my classroom all the all of a sudden jumps up and and starts screaming, um, F Maricosta, F Maricosta. Uh, I can say, hey, student, take that outside. And I can regulate time, place, and manner. I can do that, by the way, because Maricosta is a public institution and we are therefore representatives of the government. Um, morality, so obscenity 
has never received constitutional protection. Obscenity are words that are defined words, idea, images, symbols that are lewd, filthy, or disgusting. So for example, at your conventional swear words, the F word, the S word, um, those, are, those are not considered obscene. Um, those are protected words. Picting um, sexual violence or um, uh, using um, very graphic uh, terms uh, related to the female anatomy or male anatomy, um, those might actually be considered obscene um, depending on the instance. Um, so generally you're okay with the swear words, with the images, that generally tends to be another thing. Another element of speech is commercial speech. Commercial speech is speech that's designed to sell something. And the government has the right to uh, limit what you can, what you say about a product or service that you're selling. Um, I always think about this guy, Kevin Trudeau, wrote this book called Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About. It sold it in Costco for like 15 bucks a book. I made millions. And um, this book was like, it, it would talk about how um, like broccoli cures cancer. Um, a lot of outlandish things in this book uh, that ultimately uh, the FDA, Food and Drug Ad Ad Administration, arm of the government, came in and said, you know what, Kevin, you can't sell that book. You can't say that stuff. Um, and uh, ultimately, he, 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 they had to take the book um, out of, um, pr out of uh, print, uh, and he wound up going to jail for something else, something completely different. He, uh, he was a, a, a scammer. Um, but um, just an example of how you can't really say anything you want to sell a product. Moving on to um, Amendments 5 through 8, those generally offer protections for the accused. The Fifth Amendment prohibits double jeopardy, meaning that you cannot be tried twice um, if you're found not guilty for the same crime. Uh, provides you a right to uh, be to have your crimes investigated by a grand jury. So basically, the government can't just make up charges; um, they have to go through a process uh, to charge you. Uh, provides for due process rights. I'm going to talk about that one a little bit um, in the next slide. Protects you against self-incrimination and also includes the takings clause. The takings clause basically says that the government can't take away your property without providing you fair compensation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that one in a minute as well. Uh, the Sixth Amendment guarantees your right to a speedy trial, guarantees your right to a public trial, um, and a jury of your peers, and it also guarantees your right to representation by an attorney. Um, a very important amendment with respect to criminal law. Again, I'll be talking about that a little bit more next week. Uh, the Seventh Amendment provides for a trial by jury in a civil case. So the Seventh Amendment basically says those protections that you get in the Sixth Amendment also relate to you in a civil case. So the criminal protections also are civil as well. The Eighth Amendment bans cruel and unusual punishment and also bans excessive bail. So going into the Fifth Amendment in a little bit more detail, due process and the takings clause, those two elements of the Fifth Amendment are really important with respect to civil law. Procedural due process basically says that the government has to go through procedures to ensure that the result is fair. What that means is, is that you have a right to a hearing when the government wants to take action against you. So let's say that uh, I think that you're cheating in my class and so I call you out for cheating and I say, hey student, I know that you're cheating and you are going to be expelled from Maricosta College. We can't just do that. You have the right as a student uh, at a public institution to due process. It's your due process rights. You have a right to be heard and you have a right to a hearing. Uh, the same goes for criminal. You always have a right to a hearing. How much uh, due process do you get? The answer is, is that it really depends on the level of the action that is going to be taken against you, but at a minimum, 
you always have a right to a hearing. The takings clause basically says that when the government takes private pop property for public use, it has to pay a fair price. Um, uh, we generally refer to that it, um, as eminent domain. So the, the government has the power of eminent domain. It can come in and say, hey, your house is, is in a really great location. We'd really like to put a parking lot there, or we'd really like to build a freeway through it. Um, they have the right to take your property away, but they have to pay you a fair price. Something that always comes up is what's a fair price. Um, if, if you really love your house and you'd planned on holding on to it for 50 years and passing it down to your children, do they get the price that they're going to sell it for in 75 years? No. What you get is fair market price today. Uh, so a lot of people see that as a really unfair um, proposition. And to be honest, it, it kind of is. But it's in the Constitution. Substantive due process basically means that there are some rights that are fundamental that the government can't take them away from us at all. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment are really kind of interesting. Those are really, um, I, I kind of say that they're individual freedoms that are not necessarily enumerated in the Constitution. The Ninth Amendment basically says that um, rights that aren't enumerated in the Constitution are retained by the people. And basically what this means is, is that the Constitution is not meant to be an exhaustive list when it comes to your individual rights. So just because something isn't mentioned in the Constitution doesn't mean that you don't have a right to it. Uh, privacy, for example. You absolutely have a right to privacy as an individual. It's not mentioned in the Constitution, but you have a right to it, thanks to the Ninth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment is very similar to the Ninth, but it, it has a little bit of a, a, a caveat to it. And that caveat is that um, the Constitution enumerates uh, the federal government. So the federal government is defined in the Constitution. All other rights are reserved for the states and the people. So basically what it means is, is that the federal government is really limited in what it can do to what is said in the Constitution. If it's not stated in the Constitution, the federal government can't do it. It's reserved for the states or the people. One last amendment that I want to touch on uh, that is not part of the Bill of Rights is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment provides for equal protection under the law. And basically what that means is it requires the government to treat people equally. Does that mean that the government is never allowed to discriminate? The answer to that is no. What the government looks at is levels of scrutiny and classifies um, the, extent of the extent that they can discriminate, for lack of a better word. So in cases of economic and social reg regulation, the courts apply what's called minimum scrutiny. And basically what that means is, is that um, the government has the right to discriminate against individuals based on, say, income level. Um, somebody who makes $50,000 is allowed to be in a lower tax bracket than somebody who makes $250,000. That, that difference in income means that the government means that you can be discriminated against for making more money when it comes to taxes. Um, an intermediate level of scrutiny would be gender. So um, I'll give you my sister as an example. My sister's a police officer, and when she applied for the police academy, because of the kind of job that she would be doing, um, chasing and being chased by bad guys, uh, she had to meet the same physical fitness standards as her male counterparts because when you look at the criminal world, I guess for lack of a better word, um, criminals and crime doesn't really distinguish between male and female. And so a female officer who can't meet the same physical fitness, fitness standards as um, her male counterparts um, provides for a distinct disadvantage to whoever she is assigned to as a partner. Discrimination is never allowable is in cases of 
race, race, ethnicity, and fundamental rights. Um, so things like you can't discriminate against people for, for, for uh, voting, for example. Uh, if, if there is a law that is created by the government that makes it harder for one group of people to vote um, versus another group of people, then that law is most likely unconstitutional and violates the 14th Amendment. Uh, so um, 14th Amendment is, is, a, is really, when you look at it, a mouthful. And, and, and brain-wise, it's a mouthful. Uh, there's some, a couple of really good project opportunities that are going to relate to the 14th Amendment in, um, uh, in the movie review uh, and the case review. Um, opportunities. So if you're remotely interested in the 14th Amendment, I would encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, so that's it for now. A little overview of the Bill of Rights. All right, welcome back to present day. So that is the end of the lecture. Um, again, thinking about what did you learn? What will you take away from the lecture? Thinking beyond the topic and what is it that you can apply to your life um, as a result of this week's readings, this week's lecture, and what you're doing and seeing in class this week. Have a good one.